Welcome to Difficult Dialogues, Voices from the Valley. I'm Lynn Pascarella, President of Mount Holyoke College. Difficult Dialogues is intended to bring to bear voices from the Valley on some of the most complex social, legal, and ethical issues of the day. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Christopher Tinson, who is a professor of Africana Studies at Hampshire College, and Dr. Milkar Shabazz, who is a professor in the Du Bois Department of African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. The last time we were together, we were talking about the tragic events surrounding the death of Trevon Martin. Since then, there has been a flurry of activity around the movement of Black Lives Matter. And I wanted to begin by having you talk about the genesis of the movement and where it is today. So Dr. Tinson, let's start with you. Sure, um, you know, Black Lives Matter is, is as they say in the statement, uh, is a movement, not a moment. And um, what you're seeing is a lot of direct action under this uh, banner of Black Lives Matter. But it's really a statement of, of protest. It's also a statement of solidarity. Um, between all black lives who are, who are marginalized. Um, so if we read the statement, um, they're talking about black trans lives, queer folk, young folk. It's transgenerational. I think that's something that we usually miss is um, we see a lot of young people in the streets, but the movement really encapsulates just people wherever they are, whatever station of, in life they are. It emerges out of 2012 and Trayvon Martin. It didn't pick up until um, most recently with Mike Brown in terms of the kind of national uh, appeal that Black Lives Matter has, has, you know, achieved. And it still has a ways to go. We're still in the midst of this movement. What you're seeing is a lot of decentralized action, um, people in local conditions responding to those conditions. But the claim Black Lives Matter is saying really to America and to the world that um, there's still a priority that um, or ordering, a racial ordering, a social ordering in the society that devalues black life. So the assertion of black lives mattering is to kind of fight against the devaluing of black life as we're seeing with a lot of these police killings. So um, it's picking up, like every movement, it has ebbs and flows. Um, and sometimes the victories aren't that identifiable, but it is a movement that I believe is here to stay. Um, and so we're remaining to see how, how far it's gonna go. Yeah. Dr. Shabazz, there's been controversy over uh, attempts to make a claim that all lives matter. And I know recently at the University of Massachusetts, there was a, a graffiti wall outside of the New Africa House, which houses your department. And uh, it was defaced with the slogan, all lives matter. Why is this so controversial? Um, I think that there is a, uh, well, first of all, thanks for the, for the continuing conversation on these matters. This is very important, and uh, I'm, I'm honored and happy to be a part of it. The, um, what I really want to say with respect to the movement and, and even that, that, that phrase, Black Lives Matters, as, a, as the moniker, it's, the, it's aiming at something very different from, say, the civil rights movement, um, which was so bound up in trying to achieve certain kinds of legal changes and certain kinds of very specific policy changes. Whereas in this uh, movement, uh, I sense that something much more fundamental is being aimed at. What, what's being aimed at is more of a, of a, of a real culture shift uh, in this country. And, 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 and with that, uh, so for example, it's not about body cameras on police officers. It's not about um, uh, having special prosecutors when uh, unarmed blacks uh, or unarmed uh, uh, um, people are, are killed by the police and, and you, you take it from the local prosecutor to a special prosecutor. These are things that people are, are groping for, grasping for, have been pulling out of the hat that folks have talked about for decades now with this problem. But, uh, but the movement as I've experienced and as I've met, met many of the activists within it and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, did the pledge at the end and, and, and talked a lot, it's aiming at something much more fundamental to really challenge the mentality, as, as Brother Chris was saying, that, that, that ordering of society into some lives matter and some lives don't. 
And so you can come with the notion, and there's obviously people feel like it's more important to assert the notion of all lives matter. But um, the, 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 all lives do, but that's not what's happening in America. And the assertion of Black Lives Matter is to challenge that we have a situation where all lives do, uh, do not matter equally under the law or equally in society. And so, to me, then, uh, yes, there's, you know, we hear the pushback, but, uh, but I really think that um, if people get inside of what's going on now, get inside the, the, the mentality and the culture shift that people are calling for, then we'll see we've got something really profound on the ground right now. Another controversy that has emerged has really been around um, the lack of visibility for women in the movement, despite the fact that it was founded by women. That's right. So when we think about Trevon Martin and Eric Garner and, and Freddie Gray, um, Michael Brown, we're losing the fact that there are so many women yeah. of color who are brutally murdered every day. Absolutely. I mean, it's really important to understand that um, Black Lives Matter movement is the kind of, it comes out of the thinking and the, the heart, really, of three really dynamic women organizers, black women organizers, two of which are queer, um, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, and uh, Patrice Colors, basically gave us this, you know, this, this uh, phrase, this umbrella of Black Lives Matter in 2012. So I always want to, you know, salute them and their work that they continue to do. I think on the level of organizing, a lot of people, I think, are, are missing the fact that these women have an analysis of society. When they decided to put Black Lives Matter, it wasn't about sloganeering, mm -hmm. but it's really about getting us to think differently about how we think we got to this point. Um, that's why I always assert that Black Lives Matter is a statement, it's a movement, but it's also an analysis of society. It's also forcing us to rethink the history of policing, rethink the history of municipal structures, rethink you know, um, empowerment and enfranchisement, rethink what these things mean, because they become slogans. The, you know, they become kind of abstract ideas that most of us who grow up as folks of color, black folk, self-identified and socially identified as such, don't experience the same way as everybody else, don't get the same protections, don't get the same rights of victimhood, et cetera. And so I think that those are things that they're trying to get at. That's the, that's the organizational piece. In terms of representing the women of color who are experiencing state violence at the same and sometimes increasing rate uh, that black males have historically gone through, um, we have to mention Renisha McBride, Rakia Boyd, and many others um, who, who we have to lift up. I think part of that comes out of a kind of shame, if you will, that um, we can protect, right? So out of this mm -hmm. notion of a kind of patriarchal, you know, ordering that, you know, we can't take care of our women. And so the, so the movements don't really explode in the way in which they do around the male victims for some reason. It might be also tied up in notions of martyrdom that are common in American society. Um, and so it's more common for us to see male martyrs, et cetera. So I think, you know, I've been trying to think about the reason why the no large numbers aren't there um, in the same way, but it just means that we have more work to do. Um, most of the times when we're out in the street, we are lifting these names up equally because they are going through things. And mm -hmm. they might not always experience the brutality of police violence, but they could also um, experience the brutality of the state in other ways, you know, whether it's through services, whether it's in the educational circles where, you know, women, younger women are being disciplined at a disproportionate rate, being thrown out of classroom for talking out of turn or for chewing gum or this and that. So they are experiencing state violence, but it's just taking different forms, including uh, police violence. And, and especially for trans women uh, and queer women who, look, you know, they present themselves in a masculine way, if they are approached by police um, and police realize that they aren't the male body that they thought they were, then the police kind of ramp up the aggression. It's as if they have to be punished for being different. So there's a compounded layer there of, of violence and trauma that many people within uh, Black Lives Matter experience, and we don't all experience it to the same frequency or degree, 
but there is this kind of way in which the state is saying to you that you need to be kept in place, you need to be disciplined, um, and sometimes that has a fatal end, and that's those fatalities have been, have been increasing over the last few years. I know both of you as scholars have highlighted the injustice that communities of color experience within the criminal justice system. Other scholars, Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow, um, Joe Fagan in talking about the hard white racialist frame that has been enacted and perpetuated since the election of President Obama are drawing attention to the realities, uh, the lived experience of black Americans in particular. Uh, so why is this movement happening now? Why are people paying attention? Dr. Shabazz, you mentioned the body cameras. Is it the, the fact that it's visible in the way that the, the water hose is being turned on children during the civil rights movement um, brought visibility to the movement? So I think, speaking of visibility, I think that we have to think a lot about how media um, saturates our lives, fills our lives, and, and how it's very different from when I was a child growing up in the 60s, um, and the, 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 the TV screen would go all fuzzy about 11 o'clock at night <laughs> in my little hometown, and there was nothing else till, till 7 in the morning or 6 in the morning. Uh, we're now in a 24-hour news cycle. Uh, we've got the blogosphere. We've got so many things going on that um, can can instantaneously get in get word out and get into our heads about things. So I think there's a certain way in which that operates. Um, but the I think it's also something maybe a little more um, a little more subtle. Um, uh, if we again go back to the, uh, the the election of Barack Obama and the the way the the economy of the United States and indeed of the world was supposedly in the toilet. I mean, um, this was something uh, precipitated by the financial sector. The financial sector was saying that uh, we you know we got to be bailed out. Uh, the whole too big to fail, and 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 from that moment uh, and and the efforts in this country, in the political sector, to not simply take care of Wall Street, but to also raise up the bodies and the lives of people on Main Street, and what, is, what are we doing there? Um, that we've, we've, we've seen over the last five, six years a kind of an unfolding of a society that continues, continues to be ordered around the priorities, let us say, of the 1%. And so when, the, when the, 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 the trillions that this economy, the just bearing, looking at the U.S. economy, with the trillions that it generates, that, the, that, that we still continue to see this, this, this wealth that funnels up to the top and the increased shrinking of anything in the middle and let alone at the at the most vulnerable sectors of the of the society. And so, if we talk about Baltimore, we have to talk about an unemployment rate of of, of fifty percent. We have to talk about uh, uh, the, the kinds of of conditions that that don't that trace further back than two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. but were, but have clearly been um, uh, compounded since two thousand and eight with no relief or minimal relief. And people are trying to do what they can on their own, not looking to the state, not looking to local government, uh, uh, federal government. They're trying to do what they can on their own. But again, they hear a discourse that has again kind of forgotten all about the, the, the economic inequality, the deep, deep economic inequality, and instead is now fixed on uh, uh, trying to roll back little, little, little half measures of of, uh, um, of greater access to health care or things, some things that have happened, and and and, and we're not moving forward. We're not changing the, the the idea to realize that a society in which the wealth trickles up that kind of way is one in which even within the capitalist logic itself is going to hit crises because you won't have the, the basic demand at the bottom to, to keep the production going and to keep the economy going if it's all bottlenecked up at the top. So the, the, we're not learning these lessons and I think on the ground people are, have, have reached a, a, a point of uh, that it's not a it's not a momentary frustration anymore. 
It's an understanding that there is something deep and structured in this society that perpetuates a level of violence, economic violence, uh, uh, down to the level of physical, brutal violence that is just not acceptable. And, 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 and people have connected the dots to say, this has got to change. Yeah. And we'll get out here and, and, and shut down the, the roads. We'll shut down the business community. We'll shut down a city if that's what it takes to get the point. And so it's not just a little Occupy Wall Street at a, at, a, at, a, at a certain point, but now it becomes we're occupying and we're going to shut down everything, everywhere to be until we're heard. That, and that's the, the going back to the, the, the great uh, quote of Martin Luther King from the 60s, that's the cry of the unheard. Right. And I think now, though, it's, it's, it's people are serious that this, you know, and, and waking up to the fact that half measures aren't going to cut it and, and, and this is... This is the way of business in this country, and we've got to figure out and decide we're not going to conduct business this way. Same thing with segregation and Jim Crow in the 60s. The fundamental point of the civil rights movement is this how we're going to order society that, you know, people go here, people have to go there, you can't mix over here, you can't marry this group, you can't marry that group. I mean, is that fundamentally the way we want to live in the USA? And we achieved a point in the 60s where people finally said, you got John F. Kennedy getting on TV as the president in June 11, 1963, saying that, you know, this problem is as old as, as Moses or whatever, and we've got to change. We can't do this anymore, United States of America. And then, of course, he shot. His, his br brains are blown out a few months later, but, but you had achieved something there, a recognition, you know, in the country. Some, we've got to change our ways. We can't keep this, this kind of black-white thing Thing going like this. Well, it's a similar moment now, but it's not black and white. It's fundamentally about this kind of inherent economic inequality. This can't continue business as usual. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly critical race theorists like Richard Delgado have argued for years that when the law no longer serves to protect, it's no longer binding. And so we have marginalized community who are communities who are not protected under the law. And then we have what happened in Baltimore, mm -hmm. um, and, and yet President Obama is criticizing the, the people in Baltimore for their acts of violence. This is, um, this is where we're at, where the protests get criminalized, not the reason why we're in the street, right? The re there's a reason why people are taken to the streets. But when we take to the streets, people criminalize the fact that we're in the street. They criminalize the things that are being said while we're out there chanting and protesting. Um, and I think that's a fundamental problem. I mean, the way in which these things turn around to blame the victim, uh, to blame people who are calling out the inequity, is just a problem. And that's been longstanding in American society as well. And so I think that, you know, in terms of these police killings, you know, these police killings, we have to understand them, um, meaning, meaning police shootings of unarmed civilians. We have to understand those as political acts. Those are, those are acts that, that show a segment of society that there are people in this society that need to be put down, that need to be corralled, that need to be separated from everyone else. Even if that separation is in terms of resource separation or spatial separation, which is why you saw all the unrest in West Baltimore, because a lot of the folks would be, you know, diffused throughout the other parts of the city, they've been corralled into this little corner. Um, you saw the downtown was nice and protected, right? So this, that's, that's signifying the kind of spatial ordering that those folks had long lived under. And understanding police brutality uh, was a part of that, a part of that cordoning off. Um, since 2011, there's been upwards of about six million payouts in legal fees and settlements from the Baltimore police um, settling with residents, right? Ranging from 30,000 um, and all the way up to 500,000. So the point is, is that they know this has been happening for years and years and years. One of the beautiful things I think that um, the Ferguson moment showed us is it kind of put small town America on the map. It put the fact that, you know, in these municipal structures, that's where power is held. People cling to those structures. And so it's very important that, you know, Ferguson elected two extra African Americans to the city council, more reflective of 
the demographic in that area of 20,000 folks within St. Louis County. But they also put forth a bill for civilian oversight of the police, which was vehemently fought by the Fraternal Order of Police and their, their, um, their head, the, head, the person who's um, running the Fraternal Order in that area, who came to town halls and you know, meetings and uh, vocalized his discontent, but also uh, physically demonstrated his discontent. So this, you know, so my point is to say that, you know, people know what the histories are. People know what they're claiming for, what they're organizing for, and they know that it's about power, right? So how do we really get, you know, power into people's hands where they feel like they can determine their own destiny in the society? And I think that that's the fundamental issue that Professor Shabazz is talking about earlier in terms of what's 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 at stake for folks and why are they able to walk away from school and job um, and home often to be in protest for days on end i mean that was the thing about ferguson the, the only reason we get this quick you know uh response to the baltimore situation is because of ferguson is because those young folks stayed in the street um and they forced the people in power to really understand on their terms what the issues were now there's still a lot of work to be done but the point is, is that um, once the demonstrations happen, the next step is to really move it into really seizing power and, you know, the technologies of civil society. So the, the ordering institutions of this society, whether educational, political, financial, et cetera, how do we get folks who've been long disenfranchised, how do we get them at the table and how do we get them determining outcomes for society? Mm -hmm. One of the things that's beautiful about Black Lives Matter is that statement I feel, it, I feel that it has all the ingredients for a new social order. And we ridicule it because it says black in the beginning. We ridicule it because it's women and queer women, black women who wrote it. And so we don't take it as serious. But I think that if we look at that as a model for the kind of vision that the society can live under, I think we will find a lot in it that helps everybody. Well, it unveils persistent structural racism within society. Um, and I want to talk about that in relation to the prison industrial complex. Uh, so uh, people like Mamiya, Shakur, others have been pointed to as victims, uh, really political prisoners. But given the over-surveillance, over-prosecution, disparate sentencing of people of color within our criminal justice system, could we say that um, the majority of people in prison today are political prisoners? Well, I, I don't know so much that um, by virtue of the, the prosecutorial function, that's certainly a part of it, but um, the, I, I like to take it even a step, a step further. So I've given, if I may take an autobiographical moment, but um, you know, growing up, I uh, grew to have, uh, I, I grew up having a great distrust of the police. Um, and the, one of the critical moments was when um, a friend of my older, of, of my big brother, who was wearing dark, who would wear dark shades all the time, even at night, he'd have his dark shades on, he had a big afro, he was a big guy, and um, he was down at the, uh, at the pig stand, he was down at the little, little drive, drive-through uh, place, and two off-duty officers uh, sort of took offense to his presence like that, and one of them, white, slapped the dark shades off my, my big brother's uh, uh, friend. His, his street name, his nickname was Bamoose, Bull, Bull Moose, or Bamoose. And uh, Bamoose, <laughs> you know, he, he just responded. There was no badges, there was no, nothing obvious that these were cops, but at any rate, you slapped my stuff off, what's your problem? And fight ensued, he got the better, uh, um, of the of the of the two guys, the two officers who turned out later to be officers, and the but the response of the police was the collective punishment of black of young black men particularly throughout the community, and and I'm out there and my brother's running through man, you better lay <laughs> low man, get down man, and come and you I mean it was just up and down the street it was just totally out of control. And, and that went on like that, but that was like one example I come to. And um, 
And so ever, even from then, I find myself, you know, at over a half century old now, and I'm walking in, let's say, in the streets of New York, and there's the NYPD car there, and, and you know, and, and I'm, I'm averting eyes. I find myself kind of having to catch myself. And I feel like, man, I ought, I ought to be too old for this. This, mm. is, this is ridiculous. Mm. But it's still there. And, 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 the, and the key thing is, it's not anything that's going to be fixed by dialogue by, you know, the cops and the, and the black community sitting down. We can talk till the crows come home. There's got, and there has to be a decision that is taken. And, and I hear them saying, you know, the threat now comes, what, you want us to look away? Or are we going to look away from, you know, we see a crime or we see a criminal. You want us to look away? You know, then the, and then the animals, the, the thugs, they're going to they're gonna eat you alive. And the truth be told, it's the black community are the biggest victims of violence crime. And a lot of it is us against each other. Now, why is that? You go back to how you're brutalized, and it's just like a child, a, a, a child abuser. Most often, they started out having been abused, you know, when they were a child. So, you know, where do we break the cycle? It's the same way with, with the community and the police. Where are we going to break the cycle? Because right now, that, I, I see it as, as, as akin to a, a kind of a war dynamic. And, uh, and, and it's only going to get worse until we decide we're going to break the cycle. So the one minute left, uh, yeah. is there a way forward? Resistance, um, simply put. I just want to real, real quick comment on the Mumia situation. Yes. I think the political prisoners that we lift up as political prisoners are people who are repressed because they were part of political movements that were asking society to change, much like we see with Black Lives Matter. Many of these folks were part of the original BLM of the Black Liberation Movement and Black Liberation Army, or you know, they saw themselves in a, in a war situation, as Doc is saying. And so we lift them up as political prisoners. But it doesn't mean that, one, as a prisoner, you can't be politicized while you are in mm -hmm. detention. Mm -hmm. The other thing is most people are politicized through their experiences. Most people join the Black Panthers because they're politicized on the streets at the end of a billy club, as Mumia said. And then there's the also just the kind of socioeconomic ordering that produces destitute folks and um, a regulatory agency in society that, that creates deviance. Um, so the first level is the dissident. The other level is destitute, folks who are destitute and desperate. And then other folks have been made deviant. Prisons kind of regulate that. In that sense, that is a political operation. Um, and it's a historical evolution that, um, that brought us to this point. So I think that um, the way forward is, is exactly what you're seeing. You know, you're going to continue to see social unrest, people trying to destabilize the status quo and raise the stakes of um, what we mean when we say this is an inclusive society. And I think that that's the part that people are trying to say is like, we want to really, you know, put your money where your mouth is. If we actually matter, which the society is saying we don't, we're going to show you that we do. And um, that is not going to go away until there are some structural material shifts that happen. But with our protests, criminalization of these protests, the state contains crisis, and then we slowly try to push people back to normalcy uh, without anything changing. I, you know, I feel that the movement that we're a part of is about disrupting that normalcy and disrupting that kind of automatic retreat back to what's natural. Dr. Tinson, Dr. Shabazz, thank you so much for your insights. We thank truly you. appreciate it.